it's used to profile the trust. And we mean, uh, what do we mean by profiling the trust? We mean to identify and quantify all RNA species in a cell or in a tissue, a specific uh, situation. Uh, of course, we can identify different types of RNA molecules like messenger RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and microRNAs. But what we usually want to do with this type of experiment is to profile messenger RNAs, mainly protein coding RNAs, but also non coding RNAs. And the most common question that we want to, want to make when we are using RNA seq is to try to identify which are the mRNAs which are different, differentially expressed in one situation compared to the other, in what we call differential in expression. Uh, the samples that we have to use, of course, it depend on which is the question that we want to answer. So the classical questions are uh, which are the genes that are overexpressed or which are the genes which are inhibited or downregulated in uh, uh, in a knockout mice, like when we remove a gene genetically of, of, a, of a mouse model, or during differentiation, or which are the genes which are modulated upon a treatment with a drug or with a, with a growth factor. So these are the typical questions that we want to uh, answer when we are doing differential gene expression by RNAC. The first part, of course, of this type of study is experimental design. And this is the most important part because if the experimental design is not uh, completely done and it's not well designed, what we can uh, obtain is uh, that our results are not reflected, are not answering our first question in the first place. So the first thing that we have to do is to define control groups. And of course, control groups are wild type mice for a knockout experiment or a vehicle tre uh, treated uh, sample for uh, experiments with uh, drugs or with factors. Another important decision to make is the number of replicates in our experiment. Why do we need to replicate? Because we have to estimate biological variants. And we need to estimate the biological variants in order to give statistically significant results. The more replicates we have in our experiment, the more powerful is going to be uh, the, our result. There are some ways to estimate the sample size for RNA seq experiments, but it's easier to apply a simple rule of thumb. If we are sampling uh, cell, cells in culture that are less violent between them, then five replicates per sample group is going to be enough. Definitely no, not less than three. If we are using tissues, cells extracted from mice or from human samples, then we have to increase the number of replicates because the variance is higher in samples coming from individuals or from tissues. And if we are using human samples for sure, with an increase in biological variance, we would need more than 20 samples. Okay, so the next step in experimental design is to decide the protocol to use to prepare the library. We have two choices. We have uh, poly A selection in order to obtain only messenger RNAs using poly A traits, or we can use total RNA with the right addition in order to remove the most abundant RNAs which are coming from ribosome RNAs from our sample. Of course, it depends on what we want to measure. If we want to measure the standard expression of protein coding genes mainly, we will go to a poly A selected mRNA library preparation. Why? If we want to study alternative splicing or we want to study non coding RNAs, since many of non coding RNAs do not have a poly A tail, we should go for total RNA extraction with viral addition. If we want to study also alternative splicing, of course we would like to use bigger fragments. And use also the alternative, the alternative sequencing called RN sequencing, where we can sequence bigger fragments from both ends, from five prime and from three prime, uh, improving the, the ability of RNA seq to uh, identify bigger fragments and discriminate between isoforms of genes. Another important part of the experimental design is the coverage. By coverage, we mean the total number of reads we sequence each sample. For a transcriptomic analysis, a standard transcriptomic analysis is much more relevant than the number of replicates sample coverage, and 10 million reads would be okay. 
On the other hand, if we want to profile rare events or non-coding RNAs, or if we want to study alternative splicing, we need much more coverage. Uh, from 60 million to 90 million reads per sample would be okay. Another important aspect of the experimental design is try to control uh, possible potential batch effects. Uh, if we are going to prepare more than 24 samples, we are going to prepare the samples in different, on different days uh, if we are not using a robot. So we are going to have eventually batch effects. So the library preparation in one day can be different from the library preparation in a second day. So one of the ways we could uh, avoid problems with batch effects like aliasing, meaning that all the samples in a group are prepared on a day and, and then hence you cannot distinguish the effects from, uh, from our treatment or from, from our study from the batch effects is to randomize the samples. So if we are going to prepare in studies with more than 24 samples, we have to remember that we should randomize the samples of our study within the different page batches. <clears throat> the next part of the, of the experiment, of course, is the, is the uh, sequencing and then the data analysis. So for the data analysis part, uh, the first part uh, of this analysis is to take the reads that we have sequenced uh, using the next generation sequencing and align those reads to the reference genome. After the alignment of the reads, we have to count the genes that are mapping to exons of uh, the genes, and for this we should use uh, a well-known annotation of genes that we can obtain from different databases, like RefSec from NCBI or a gene code from NCBI. So as a first result, we will obtain matrix of genes quantified for the different samples in our study. And by applying statistical tests, which try to identify which are the genes with higher or lower levels in one sample type to the other sample type, we will obtain a list of what we call different expressed genes. If we want to compare the expression of the genes, one gene to each other, we should ask normalized gene expression in terms of read counts by the length of the gene, since genes uh, that are longer are more probable to be sequenced than genes that are short. So, as a first result of the differential gene expression, we will obtain also the log fold change, the fold change of the expression in one type of sample against the other. So, depending on the comparisons that we have, so treated cells against controlled cells, we will have also a p value, which is given as the significance of our test. And of course, we should also have a false discovery rate or a correction of that p-value for the multiple comparisons in order to control the type 1 error, so in order to control the false positive. Okay, in the end, we have obtained a list of differential expressed genes, both unregulated in our situation or downregulated, or the list of generally called modulated expressed genes. It can be a hundred or even more, or thousands of genes. So how can we extract biological information of this huge list? The first step is to annotate genes based on the pathway, on the biological pathway or the biological process that they belong to, like uh, signaling or mitochondrial like metabolism or, uh, or any kind of pathway that we can imagine. We also can search for signatures, so groups of genes associated to a particular phenotype, and for that we have to annotate them all. Then, in order to identify pathways which are correlated to our experiment, we have to apply what is called functional enrichment analysis. In the first type of enrichment analysis, we try to overlap our differentially expressed genes with pathways, and for that we use the Fisher test and statistics. And the second way of doing that is what is called gene set enrichment analysis, which try to correlate gene expression levels of genes with their belonging to the different pathways for gene signal. Of course, at the end, we're going to have p values and force discovery rate applied in this case not to single genes but to groups of genes like pathways or processes. Let's sum up what we've learned by talking to Jose from the Center for Omic Sciences at Ospedale San Raffaele. RNA-seq is a technique to profile the transcriptome. 
it is crucial to pay attention to the experimental design. Many are the factors we have to keep in mind. The number of replicates to ensure statistical power, the right protocol to use in order to answer our questions, and how to avoid batch effects. We have then focused on differential gene expression analysis, where you apply a statistical test to obtain a list of modulated genes with a defined significance. From this list of genes, we can then extract biological information by performing a functional enrichment analysis.